today's speaker, Stephen Rowe. Stephen is a graduate student at the University of Toronto studying things that explode in the universe. And he'll be talking to you about that today. He did his undergraduate at Queen's University in mathematics and physics, and has put that to well, very good use uh, in his graduate studies here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to give it to Stephen. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome, welcome. So today I'll be talking about explosions and the physics behind explosions. Um, and ultimately at the end I'll be discussing supernovae, how stars explode. But before we get to supernovae, I'd like to bring something a little bit more familiar and show some examples of explosions. Okay, that's a good way to start any Hollywood film, and that's how I'm going to start this talk. Okay? Uh, and so I'm going to show a clip of one of my most favorite TV introductions. It's from CSI Miami, and I think it will get everyone's blood going a little bit. Okay? So here we go. I might have to adjust the volume. Okay. <laughs> so, so what do we see here, okay? This is Horatio, or played by David Crusoe, and it's pretty impressive how calm he is, collected and composed when he walks away from the explosion, okay? You notice that he was so calm he could even time his sunglasses and takes them off when he's leaving the car, puts them back on, perfect timing, right? And so, definitely, much of his composure and his calmness is due to his incredible acting ability, but also, but also, um, I'm sure that there are a lot of demolitionists and experts there that were reassuring him that's going to be completely okay. Okay, once you get to this line over here that you don't see, okay, we're going to blow it up and you'll be just fine. Right? There's a lot of explosion physics here, and we understand much of those physics enough that we can create Hollywood scenes like this. Okay? Let me convince you with a few more examples of how well we understand explosions work. Okay? So here, look, here's another one. We know them so well that we detonate them across our own cities. Okay? We know what chemicals to put into them to generate the colors. We know how to orient the chemicals such that we get the beautiful patterns that we see. We even understand why, to some degree, or let me, let me backtrack. <laughs> uh, we understand why exactly this rocket exploded last week. This is the Antares rocket. What happened, or the destination of this rocket was towards the International Space Station. It was bringing supplies up for the astronauts there, and also a suite of science experiments. Now, when, so, let me, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, the astronauts are going to be completely fine, actually. Uh, about a few days later, the Russians sent up a supply rocket to make sure that uh, they were okay. There was also about uh, well over a year's worth of reserves, just in case they can't send the rockets up. And just in case there are also shuttles or capsules, such that when there is something wrong with the ISS, they can just run towards the capsules, fly back to Earth. We have many precautionaries and fail-safes. Okay. But we were a little surprised when this Antares rocket blew up. And it was surprising to me to learn that this explosion wasn't an accident. Okay. It was on purpose. Now, let me explain further what happened here. What happened was is the Antares rocket was flying up, and it began to lose thrust almost immediately. You could see it teeter a little bit before it exploded. What happened is that one of the operators, one of their main jobs is to stand over this big self-destruct button in case something goes horribly wrong. Otherwise, this rocket could keep going with enough energy to go to the ISS, okay, but it could keep going and, and crash into possibly a nearby city. That's the worst case scenario. So instead of letting that happen, we have enough area such that we can see where the rocket's going and detonate if something goes wrong. 
Okay? So this explosion was a self-destruct. It was well intended. There are a lot of calculations, simulations that are involved in these explosions. So, so we make sure we understand every worst case scenario, at least that we can conceive of. Okay? And this was one of the worst case scenarios and it turned out exactly the way we wanted it to. No one got hurt in the accident. It was just a setback in progress. Okay? We understand how explosions work. So that we have them in Hollywood films, such that David Crusoe can walk away very calmly okay, to generate this really, one of my favorite scenes at least. And if only this sort of information or the science of astronomy was known 1800 years ago. Okay? 1800 years ago, a big star just suddenly appeared in the sky. And the Chinese astronomers actually called it a guest star. Okay? <laughs> it made a cameo appearance in the foot of Centaurus. And what they recorded was a guest star emerged and displayed five colors, pleasure, and anger. It decreased gradually in size and in brightness. And after eight months, it disappeared. According to the standard prognostication, this means military action. Okay? So I think they were a little bit spooked, a little bit alarmed. Maybe some of them took this as a sign. And if you continue reading in uh, the book of later Han, you'll see that they actually did go to war and had battles. Um, and so, one question that we have is, what was responsible for this sudden star to appear? And 1800 years later, we can look back with our telescopes and see. We looked at the foot of Centaurus, and this is what we found. Okay? This is called a supernova remnant. What I'm showing you here is a composite image from Spitzer and Chandra. Those are space telescopes. Spitzer looks in the infrared. That's the light that you feel coming out of your oven or your toaster. And Chandra looks in X-ray. So it's like we took one of those big body X-ray scanners and just put it up into space so we could see X-rays from uh, the universe. And so, uh, oh, I should say that Spitzer is displayed in red. Okay, it's seeing all the red colors. Chandra looks in green and blue. Oh, let me say this. So Chandra looks at X-ray and then recolors it in green and blue so that we can see it. And so we have this composite image. What happened in the supernova remnants is 1800 years ago, there was a supernova, or let me say, there was a star here formerly, and it exploded. It ejected all of its debris into its surroundings, pushed out, and created these two shock waves. Okay? The shock waves are strong enough that it produces X-rays. X-rays are a very strong surface en source of energy. And so this explosion, actually, if you look at the debris speed today, it's still occurring 1800 years later. It's a lot dimmer, right? but it's still occurring. We found several more supernova remnants after that. You see a variety of different types of explosions, okay, and they all create these beautiful geometries. Some are near perfect circles, and some are really not circles over here. Okay. And all these colors tell you what type of light that you're seeing, some of the chemistry that you're seeing here. And they look absolutely ugh, wonderful. In some way, there's beauty behind chaos in these explosions. Well, I don't think David Crusoe is very pleased, okay? He probably wants to know who blew up his SUV. It's great that we know all these explosion physics. That's nice, right? And astronomers are pleased that we know that it was a star formerly that exploded. But we like to know what type of star, okay? That's a, that's a detail that seems important, right? So we look at not supernovae that occurred, or what the supernova looked like 1,800 years later. We start looking for supernovae live, okay? So one of the... The uh, first supernova that we've seen um, is ni uh, not in history, but with our new telescopes. It was in 1994. This is called Supernova 1994D. And here, well, before I talk about the supernova, let me explain what you're actually seeing. This is a galaxy far, far away. Okay? And what you see is a bright spot in the middle, a halo of light around it, and this sort of nebulous enigma, this sort of dark thunderstorm cloud thing there. What you're seeing is a host of stars and gas around a disk. Think about how the planets are orbiting around the sun like a disk. Okay? So there's stars and gas here and dust. In the center, it looks like there's just one big star. But in fact, there are billions of stars there. And it's the, it's the collective luminosity of all these stars coming together in one place that looks like one bright star. Okay? There's actually billions of stars embedded in the center. The halo of light that you see above and below, think of them as little bees swarming around the galaxy. Okay? And these are all stars. We can't pinpoint or we can't look exactly at each star okay, like we do in the night sky because there's so many stars in this galaxy so far away 
Okay, it just looks like an ensemble of them, almost a fog. Okay. And this dark cloud thing that you see here, that's the dust and gas. It doesn't emit much light. In fact, it obscures a lot of the light. The starlight, or so imagine this, is that there's starlight over here, and there's a big dark cloud in front of you, you're just going to be standing in the shadow. And so what you see here is actually the shadow of the dust and gas. And then one day, one of these buzzing stars decided to explode and become as luminous as the galaxy itself for several, several weeks. And so as crime scene investigators, what you want to do is you want to look at the light, you want to look at the duration of the explosion, you want to see what kind of colors come out. And from this, you can interpret how much energy there was in the explosion, the amount of mass needed to explode this star, the speed of the debris that's flying out, and also the chemical composition. And you can infer backwards, like a crime scene, and determine what type of star exploded. Okay? So, you know, some of you may be wondering why we do this sort of backwards approach. We look at all these light and things like that. Why don't we just enhance the image, right? And I sort of said, uh, again and again, that this galaxy is really far away. If I enhance this image, this is what you'd see, okay? It's just a zoom up, right? I'm not going to keep zooming in and see this sinister angry face, okay, with someone kind of you know, pushing a self-destruct button of the star, right? That's as good as you're going to get. So instead of trying to wait and wait and wait for maybe a really close supernova, we just look at lots of galaxies, okay? We just keep looking over and over and over again at galaxies far away and look for supernova here, supernova here, and here. There have to be two in one year in this galaxy. There's one over here. This one have to have three in about a decade, and there's one over here, okay? And we try and understand what the, st what the star was that exploded and how much energy came out of it and apply all the physics that we understand. One day, we were actually really, really, really lucky, okay? One day, a supernova occurred in a galaxy very close to us. This is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. Now before, again, I talk about the supernova, let me explain to what you're seeing. Okay, this is a bird's eye view of a galaxy, a bird's eye view of the disk. What's really nice is that you're not looking at the galaxy on an edge. And what that means is that there, aren't going to, there isn't going to be much gas and dust that's going to obscure the light. That's not going to obscure the data that you're going to collect. So this is a pristine, perfect, best case scenario supernova that occurred very, very close to us. And we've been looking at this Whirlpool galaxy for so long because it's, it's incredibly beautiful, but also because there's a lot of other science that we can understand. See all these spiral waves coming out of it, these spiral arms? Those spiral arms are generated okay, because of this guy right here. That's another galaxy. This galaxy, this Whirlpool galaxy, is an active collision with another one. And before they collide, they generate a lot of waves. Think of sloshing. Okay? And it turns out these waves for a galaxy is something that we're not very familiar with. They look like arms coming out of it. Okay? They look like spirals. So a lot of interesting physics going on. And so we've been studying this guy for a long time. And boom, a supernova occurred. Okay? So this is really good news. Here's it. Okay, here's it, close up. Here we go. There's before, there's a really bright thing after. Okay? And when we do all of our understand or all of our science and we work our way back from the crime scene, we predict that it should be a wolf ride star. A wolf ride star is very, very special to me because it's directly a core piece I want to say it's a, it's a core backbone of my thesis here in my research. So when I heard that a wolf ride star exploded, that's really good news because I can't go and see wolf ride stars. I can't uh, see actually many in their own galaxy because they're so rare. So the next best thing you could do is just blow one up and see what comes out, right? And so when one of these exploded, that's fantastic news, right? So what do we, and my hope is, is what, what can we learn? Well, before we go on, okay, we want to see the crime before the, or the scene before the explosion, the scene before the crime, okay? We can look at old photos of the galaxy, okay? Old, old photos, kind of like the old family photos that you have. This is, these are two images made by Hubble, okay? One in 2005 and one in 2013. What we did was we looked at Hubble's archival data. We dug through all the photo albums and looked and looked for the Whirlpool galaxy. Then we looked for an image that was zoomed in to that part of the galaxy and hoped that we could see the culprit before it was going to explode, okay, the bomb. And fortunately, we did. 
So here's this sort of big bright spot, okay, that's a star here, and afterwards, well, there's still some sort of light source there, okay, but there's seriously, or there's, there's a significant change between these two images. The reason there's still a light source there is because, remember, explosions take a long time to die out, okay, at least the ones in space. They're so energetic that two years after the explosion, we still see the afterglow. Right? They can keep going, like we saw before, 1800 years later, it'll just be much dimmer. So here's our culprit. Here's the bad guy, okay? What's the bad guy? It's this massive thing, okay? This is a yellow supergiant. It's absolutely enormous, okay? It's, it about, has about roughly 50 to 100 times more mass than the sun. So just take 50 suns or 100 and just shove them into one place and make it one big star. The size of the star is about 500 times larger. Okay, that's pretty cool. What's not cool is that a lot of people predicted it was a Wolfride star, okay? And if I plop the Wolfride star right next to the supergiant, that's how big it would be. See, see a problem here, okay? This is a factor of about 50 to 100 okay, in size that we got wrong. Let me, let me make that a little bit more clear. That's the difference between a mouse and an elephant, all right? So that's a serious issue in our understanding of explosion physics. We never thought it would be this bad. It's a little bit embarrassing, to be honest. But to be fair, there were a few teams that, dis that predicted it was a yellow supergiant. But there were several more teams that predicted it was a wolf ride star. So there's some strange inconsistency between these two groups, right? We, we all want to get the same answer in the back of the book, right? And so there's something going on, okay? And Team Elephant and Team Mouse fought for about two years, right? Until we, took, we looked back into the old photos and realized it was most definitely the yellow supergiant. Now, most people could give up, maybe. Some people would go way back to the beginning and find out what assumption did they make that was wrong. That's a really good way to go. I think that's how most physics is done. And some people decide to look for something new, something we haven't seen before, maybe. Right? Maybe there's some piece of information about these supernovae that must clearly manifest okay, from differently from this star to this star. Okay? There must be a better way, because we're probably going to make this mistake again. Well, what you can do is try and understand explosions here on Earth. Maybe there's some property that we can understand really well, and s maybe hope that it's some... Uh, something similar to something in space, right? We can't produce a star here, but we can at least explode many things, right, and see what comes out. We hope the physics is still the same. So this is a slow motion video of a firework rising into the sky. Okay, I'm going to show it to you. Here it's rising. Can you see the firework? Okay, I'm going to show it to you again. There's a firework. You guys might have had this sort of uncomfortable feeling that there's something you see that you, didn't, that you haven't seen before, right? You, you want, I'm going to pull my mouse over. I think that's the only way I can... Oh, hold on. There we go. Okay. Oh, my taskbar is gone. Okay. There! Do you see that? There was a flash of light, right? I wasn't expecting that when I was YouTubing uh, slow motion fireworks, okay? There's a big burst of light there. And if we capture the frames, there it is. Oh, capture the frames, there it is. Okay. What is that burst of light? Apparently, all fireworks have two bursts of light. We just always miss the first one. The reason is because this flash lasts about five milliseconds, and you don't see it before this flash occurs. Right? And so the question is, is, are supernovae in some way similar to fireworks? Is there some flash so we just w weren't looking carefully enough? Right? Maybe it was a quick blink that we missed. Now before I go on, okay, and, and follow that lead, okay, let me explain to you how a firework works. What happens is you take a big ball of uh, gunpowder, you stick it onto a rocket, and you throw it up into the, into the air. And once it gets high enough, you detonate it, and then it makes an explosion. When you detonate it, the gunpowder is ignited, and a lot of heat and light is released. And the moment that the rocket ruptures, all this light escapes and you see a flash. The reason you don't just see a flash, okay, but you also see these weird streams coming out, is because the firework is embedded with shrapnels, pieces of metal. Titanium, copper, magnesium, those are the colors that are generated when you burn them. Okay? 
So loaded in the firework is all this shrapnel. When we blow it up, the shrapnel flies out, and we see this firework instead, or this flash over here. And so it's kind of a trick, okay? Kind of a, a way of design of how this firework was made. But maybe supernovae could have a flash or something there. It's a hunch. So why don't we follow it? But before I do, I need to describe a little bit of stellar structure, a little bit about the st structure of stars. Here is a little photo album of stars. There's a sun, there's a bigger star, and there's another one. Okay. If I cut one of these stars in half, you have the cross section. I'm cutting a watermelon. Okay. And here's my little toy diagram. Okay. Now, these stars are just big balls of hot gas. Okay. And because there's mass in these stars, there's gravity, and so it's pulled in together, okay? Just like you're pulled down towards the Earth. Now, naturally, at the center of the star, it's more denser, right? That makes sense, because the stuff at the center of the star has to feel all the weight of the gas above it, squishing it down. You can imagine if I asked one of you to lie down on the floor and asked 50 more volunteers to lie down on top of you, right? The bottom person is going to get squished. Right? It'll become more dense. Okay? Now, there's gravity, but what keeps it up? Why doesn't a star just keep shrinking or something? Right? Well, it's because there's pressure. If you've ever squeezed gas, like in a balloon, or squeezed air through a pump, right, you notice it gets harder and harder and harder to squeeze air in. It's because it's building pressure. And so as gravity tries to squeeze harder and harder the star together, it pushes back harder and harder. Eventually, there's an equilibrium. There's a balance there. And a star can exist for, let's say, for the sun, four and a half billion years, and it can keep existing for another four and a half billion years before something else happens. Okay? Now, this winter, I would like you to try this experiment. When you go to a party or a celebration of sorts, grab a balloon. It could be helium or just filled with air. And go outside in the, in the cold you'll see that the balloon starts to shrink and shrink and shrink, right? If you come back inside, the air isn't gone. If you come back inside, you just see it expand again, come back to its original size. What's happening is that the balloon is getting colder, okay, and the temperature is dropping because the outside's cold. And so, as a result, the pressure drops, okay, and it starts to shrink. And when you bring it back inside, the warmth of the room goes into the balloon and it expands again. Now that's an interesting property of gas. Okay, if it gets colder, it starts to shrink. So why doesn't a star like the sun shrink? We feel all the heat coming from it, right? It has to be cooling down. The universe is freezing, right? Well, it's because there's something going on in the core and it's called nuclear fusion. There's this huge reservoir of energy in the atom that was predicted by Einstein. And so all this energy is being tapped out and heating the rest of the star, keeping it going, right? keeping that ball of gas hot enough so it can stay afloat in some ways, okay? keep to that size. And it's actually one of the key technologies that we like to have in the future. It's the holy grail. It's the best or most energy that we can think of uh, for, that we can harness in the universe. Okay? So there's pressure, okay, oh, before I go on there, there's pressure there. For some stars, very massive stars, the heat source actually just drops. It just stops fusing. It's not enough to keep the star afloat. And as a result, it's actually pretty catastrophic. As a result, the pressure at the bottom just completely gives out. So imagine the chair legs beneath you all just giving out. You immediately fall to the floor, right? Well, that's what the star basically does. Gravity wins. It pulls the core and collapses it. And the rest of the star is reacting. But most of the mass is in the, is in the center of the star, so it, and because we're getting closer towards the center, it, it collapses faster than the rest of the gas here. Okay? So what we have is actually an implosion when this fuel source is gone. Another word for it is called core collapse. Now, the question is, is what does the rest of the star do? I promised you an explosion, okay? And I'm gonna give you one. Here you go, okay? So I'm going to do a, a little demo here. So what you all want you to imagine okay, is that here's the core of the star, and here's a slab of gas that's above it. It's less massive, and another slab of gas above that that's less massive. Okay? And what's going to happen is the core is going to suddenly collapse, and naturally these two things will fall down. Okay? And the question is, is what happens? Right? 
So we've all played basketball. We know what the basketball is going to do. It's going to bounce. We've all played tennis, maybe, or seen tennis. We, and you know it bounces. Okay. When I stack these two together, here's what's going to happen. You see that? Whoa! I got more. Okay, ready? Do that again. Okay, so watch out. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do it one more time. You see that? Whoa! Okay. So it's a little dangerous, sorry. You can hold on to it or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> but you all saw the demo. Okay. What's going on is that the tennis ball isn't hitting something that's just sitting there, like the table or the ground. Okay. It's actually hitting a basketball that just bounced off something else. And so this basketball has a lot of momentum and it crashes into the tennis ball and propels it further. It gives its momentum and dumps it to the tennis ball. Okay? Imagine a large football player just hitting a small football player. It's the same physics that's going on here. Okay? So in a star, what we have is an implosion which ultimately generates an explosion with the rest of the star. Okay? This is called a core collapse supernova. And these are about 75% of all explosions in the sky, or supernova in the sky, let me say that. Okay? Another word for it is a bounce explosion, rebound explosion. It's a lot of fun learning about explosions. Okay? Here's a little, here's a demo again. Now, something a little bit unrealistic. Okay? A star isn't just made of two slabs of material <laughs> and a core. It's actually made of a continuum of slabs, let's say. Right? There are ever-shrinking tennis balls or layers of mass rising up to the surface, okay? And so the star should actually look sort of like this, right? And it becomes, it's very dense in the center and very less dense as you get towards the surface, kind of like climbing a mountain. You know, the air gets less dense, it's harder to breathe as you go away from uh, the, the surface of the Earth. And so what would happen if I dropped this big thing in the room? I would love to find out. I, I think we have some idea. We can use our imagination. Right? We need some awesome demo and we have to go outside. Right? But you can imagine how impressive this is or this would be. Right? Well, I can't build you this. Okay? I would love to. But I can bring you something pretty close. And if you stare at it long enough, it looks something like a whip. Doesn't it? Right? So here's a whip. Okay? I'm going to... It's okay, you're, you're okay for now. Uh, here's a whip. It's actually, um, let me go in front actually. It's my supervisor's whip, okay, to my surprise. Okay. Uh, and so he brought in one day talking about the same physics. I went, whoa, where'd that come from? Okay. Uh, and so here's a whip, and I'm going to jump onto the table. Okay. And so what I want you to imagine is on one end of the whip, you have the surface of the star. It's less dense, it's thinner on this side of the whip. And the other side of the whip, that's towards the center. Okay? And so I'm not going to just drop the whip. I don't get the same physics that way. Okay? It's a little bit different technology. Okay? Instead, I'm going to give energy into this whip. Okay? Not by gravity, by dropping it. By providing an impulse through the handle. Okay? So what's going to happen is I'm going to snap it. Okay? And a pulse of energy is going to propagate down the whip. And this energy becomes more intense as it propagates through. Okay? And the reason is because there's less and less amount of whip, the thickness decreases, and so the intensity rises in the energy that's in this whip until it gets to the end. And all the energy has to go somewhere, and most of the energy goes into the sound that you're going to hear. Okay? If I also put a thermometer of wherever I crack the air, you also notice that the air heats up significantly. And if I was really good, okay, if I was some kind of superhero or something, or if I had, I don't know, a special whip, I could actually heat up the air so much to generate light. Okay? And supernovae are incredibly <coughs> energetic, and they actually generate tons of light. Okay? But before we go there, I'm going to try my best to do this. I'm going to ask uh, the group of four here if you guys could stand up just for a moment and, and stand off to the side. I can't guarantee. Um, I learned how to use this whip honestly last night. Okay? <laughs> I was in one of the rooms upstairs standing on the corner going, Okay, let's see how, how far I can hit you guys. And I think it's, it's more or less safe. I don't know about the camera, though. Okay? Um, and so uh, there's a good chance that I'll, I'll get this working, but let me warm up at least. Okay? 
Okay, oh, that was great. Okay, you got that? <laughs> was first try, that's fantastic. Okay, here we go, let's do it again. Oh, it's a little tricky. I'm glad my supervisor isn't as good either, okay? <laughs> but, uh, ooh, let's get in there. Do you hear the snap? I, I, I did this once, okay? Oh, there we go. Oh, I heard a really good snap last night. I want to get that snap, ready? Oh, there we go, okay? One more time. Okay, no, one more time. I want to do one more. This is actually really fun. Okay, you want to do one more time? This is really fun. Oh, wait, well, last one, I swear. L last night I was actually sweating because I was like, oh my goodness, this isn't working. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. That was a snap. Last night I was kind of panicking. Oh, you can have a seat because uh, it wasn't working. One in ten. Oh my goodness. Uh, but thankfully you heard that. I'm going to stop. Okay. I'm not going to challenge that. So you heard a whip. You heard a snap. Right? There's a lot of energy being dumped into the air. And so what we want to do is when we look at these stars that are about to explode, we want to predict what kind of snap we're going to hear. Okay? And so for a wolf ride star over here, it's a smaller star, less massive. Okay? And a supergiant is incredibly massive and it's enormous. So you'd think that they would have, you know, it, this is an analogy, so the physics are quite different, but in some ways they're the same. You think there'd be a longer whip, you get a different snap. If you get a thicker whip, you get a different snap. If, you can also change the composition of the whip, and stars have different compositions, and you get a different snap. Part of my research is to figure out what the snap the Wolf Riot star would make, okay? And try and look for it. Well, let me give you a more audible uh, version of what we would like to see. Here is the uh, Wolf Riot, okay? Okay, well, it's, it sounds better here, but it'll be a high-pitched snap. Okay, and let's compare it to the supergiant. Okay, so here you go. Okay, this is really fun. I figured out, I figured out I, can, I could do this too. Okay, <laughs> this is really great. Oh, oh no. Okay, here we go, okay. Okay, so you hear two different snaps, okay? And one snap, for the wolf ride star, there'd be a lighter whip, and the whip snap will actually last several minutes, okay? And this, is, this will come out in terms of light. And for the massive whip or the supergiant, the crack would last several hours. So what you heard there, okay, would last several hours. You'd go, <laughs> okay, that's pretty incredible, okay? The pitch that you heard for the light whip is high, okay? It's higher than the other one. And high pitch sound actually has more energy. So I really like this analogy, high pitch uh, coming from Wolf Riot Star would manifest in X-rays and gamma rays. Okay. For a supergiant, it's low pitch, and so the light that we expect to see is ultraviolet. So here we have two incredible discriminators, okay, duration and pitch, which will separate uh, these two stars okay, when we do our crime scene analysis. Okay. They're great discriminators. And so we're listening for the duration, we're listening for the pitch, listening, I guess, looking, right? And we're trying to find supernovae as early as we can. One of the really exciting things, actually, that's happening in the next decade is that we're going to have telescopes that are going to be looking at huge swaths of the sky, and it's just going to look constantly. And once it sees a flash, it's going to send all these telescopes that are right next to this telescope, and they're all going to point up together and look at it. It's kind of like having a recon team. One person sees a plane coming, and everyone just starts looking. Okay? So we're building these new instruments. Uh, we're looking for these flashes. And I think we'll have a really good understanding of what type of star exploded, finally. Okay? And uh, that's the rest of my talk. We're listening for stellar whip cracks. Thank you. Okay, so that's the time for questions. Thank you, Stephen, oh, for that welcome. very entertaining talk. Now, Astro Tours can publicly announce that our talks are exciting, oh. such as <laughs> having whips being cracked <laughs> from the top of a table. I think we should put that one on Thank the you. <laughs> I'm really glad no one got hurt, to be <laughs> honest. So that's really good. Um, so, yeah, we'll open the floor to questions. You want to take the lead? You no, you, okay. you take the lead. Yeah. 
what, uh, when they, um, when they uh, um, detonated the Antares rocket, was there any thought to maybe detonating it a few seconds later so they don't uh, blow up the launch pad? Yeah, so, so, oh, that's a really good question. Well, the thing is, is if you wait a few seconds later, you're not guaranteed to know where it's going to go. For all we know, it could have gone up two seconds and smashed back down another two seconds. We've seen rockets just go up and spiral around and do something pretty horrific. Um, and so the moment that you understand that there's something wrong, don't let it continue. That's kind of the philosophy. Yeah. We can't predict what will happen in three seconds. I'm sure the guy was thinking about it, though. <laughs> go ahead. You use uh, type 1A supernova ah, to, so, yep, to uh, tell how far away they are by the luminosity and, and how fast they're receding by the region. That's right. What is a 1A supernova? And how do you know what is a state or can't a certain luminosity? Oh, OK. So, so all the explosions I talked about here, there are all the non-type 1A supernovae. There are the type 1B, C supernovae, and type 2. Um, and so those, those supernovae come from massive stars. A type 1A supernova, they explode in a different way. You can have two scenarios, but ultimately, wait, oh, I'll talk about two scenarios. Okay, there's, you, at the end, let's say for the, star, uh, the sun, the sun is going to, at the very end of its life, eject most of its mass, and what you're left with is a carbon oxygen star. And so you can detonate this carbon oxygen star if you had, let's say, another star. There's some stars that actually there's two where they orbit each other. They're like couples in the sky, okay? Where the other star is also a white dwarf. And slowly over time, they gravitate towards each other and become one, and then explode, okay? There's another way where maybe there's a big star that hasn't reached that, uh, the two uh, white dwarfs, so the carbon oxygen stars, yet. And this one can dump mass and keep throwing mass onto the other one, the little one, until that one explodes as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, right, so the universe thing. Okay, so the way that we use... Uh, oh, what was your question? There's so many things. Like, what is a 1A? Oh, yeah, okay, okay, sure. So, yeah, so, so the, uh, the main discriminator is that it has no... Oh, all of a sudden my qualities are kind of creeping up to me. It has no hydrogen. Okay, good. It has no hydrogen in its chemical composition. Um, uh, but the reason, or the way, what's beautiful about these stars is that um, the mass to which they explode at, it doesn't vary too much between stars. It's all around 1, 1 1.4 or something, right? And so when they detonate, they're all roughly the same explosion. And so when you have the same explosion, you can understand exactly through explosion physics, and understanding what t how much energy is generated, right? You can always get the same explosion, the same amount of light occurring. And so if you see the same explosion here, and there, and there, you can start measuring distances to them. Okay. And then what else you can do is look at the galaxy to which these uh, stars came from and then see how fast they're receding away from us. So once you get distance and velocity and you start plotting those two, two things together, you find out all galaxies are running away from us. And so uh, there, the sta there are standard candles in the sense that the explosion is very well understood. They're very systematically the same. And we can standardize them. I, I <laughs> So it's kind of like the same light, but further away, we know it's farther away. And so we can, we can interpret it backwards. So it was a long way discussion. Yeah. Long answer. Uh, you can you wave your hand up the whole time? Yeah. So, you know when supernovas, when stars burst into supernovas, they're really loud? Uh huh. For example, can you probably hear more from Earth? Oh, that's a really good question. And that's probably the most relevant question in a way. Right to everyone else is, if a supernova went off, could you hear it from Earth? So when you hear a sound, okay, I'm putting a lot of energy into the air, and there's a rapid change in this air, and it vibrates all the air around it, and this vibration probably gets out, kind of like a ripple in the pond, and so you'll hear something, or you hear a snap. There's a lot of void in space actually, but there's still gas. So if one of these explosions occurred, it would ripple the gas around it, and eventually the sine wave would arrive to Earth. The, the, I guess for a scientist, the unfortunate thing is that the gas is very diffuse. Right? And so the, if you went further up into space, away from Earth, it's harder and harder to hear things just because there's less medium right, to, 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 let's say, uh, tickle the hairs in your ears. Right? <laughs> And so, but we do have, we can have detectors, I imagine. You can just have a detector that's very sensitive and measure slight changes, okay, in the gas. It's tricky because the density of 
of gas in the air is so low that you actually would just find a single particle of gas in some region of space. You just find a single particle of gas in a meters cubed. Okay? It's still a gas, right? But it's just like a billiard ball flying around. And how do you know if this billiard ball is moving a little bit faster from a supernova? That's actually, I don't know. <laughs> That's a really good question. If I, were, if I had all the money and all the like, aliens in the world to help me, I'd probably just build like the biggest drum ever, right? And just watch it warble, right? <laughs> and touch all the gas, right? And see what's going on. Um, but really small, so, so maybe way later in the future, I hope. But it sounds like we could get that with gravity. Like we should be able to detect it with the gravity. Detector. Yes. Get to the sensitivity of doing that. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so there's, there's once a big ball of mass and has lots of gravity, and all of a sudden all the mass is just thrown everywhere else. Right? So gravity is slightly changing over there. And so one idea is that you can detect supernovae or explosions by measuring very carefully how the gravity on Earth changes. It's, I, I, I'm not an expert in the field. There are, my friends are somewhere here, and they're experts in the field. Um, but I think it's really, really challenging to detect a sudden shift in mass. Um, but that's interesting. I would like to know. <laughs> yeah. Actually, for these, for these supernovae, uh, um, there's predictions, since the core is suddenly collapsing and the gravity is suddenly changing, they should produce gravitational waves as well. And so it's, it's actually really fun. If, if we detect a gravity wave from, let's say, uh, one of these explosions, that's one signal. Then you detect uh, the breakout or that whip crack. That's another point of the explosion that says, hey, whatever happened in the star finally reached the surface. And then with those two numbers, you can, you can actually understand a lot about the physics. How fast did that that did, uh, the pulse and the whip. What's the delay? Yeah, exactly. How long did it take to get there? So there's a lot of really fun things we can do once we detect. Yeah. Yep, yeah, we have the back. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about uh, if you your metaphor of the fireworks. Yeah. When you see this explosion, the amount of energy is not able to transform anything and disappears in a few seconds. Yeah? Yeah. But what happened with supernova? Yeah, exactly. So that's a good question. So for fireworks, um, they use chemical energy. And so when you blow up gunpowder, um, all the, well, I'm not a, chemi a chemist. So I'll just say like there's chemical energy there. Nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, you can get so much more energy. I did a really rough calculation. Um, well, let's see how it goes. If I took three swimming pools, Olympic sized swimming pools, okay, of water, and water, there's hydrogen and oxygen in the H2O. If I collected all that hydrogen and I just fuse it all, okay, you could supply the entire Earth's power for one year. That's how much energy we're talking about, except much more, okay, <laughs> much more. Um, it, let's say stellar amounts, right? For a supernova, what's going on is there's a lot of rapid fusion, let's say for type 1As. The carbon oxygen suddenly burns very quickly into iron and things like that, and nickel. Sometimes it makes um, elements that are more heavier than what we expected, that they shouldn't be made. And actually, let me say it this way, is that it fuses that way to make really heavy elements, and some of these elements can fission and decay backwards, like uranium fission. And so all these things generate tons of energy um, to have a supernova. So, so let, me, let, me, let me simplify all that to say that these explosions I'm describing about, they're, they're generated by nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. Those are energies are way outside of chemicals. And so they can persist for a very long time. Um, yeah. uh, in your intro to the lecture on the website, you talked about there's been a, a handful of detections of these ultraviolet and or gamma ray flashes before. Yeah. Nearby. Yes. How were they detected? How far in advance were they detected? And was it sufficient that people could actually get their telescopes pointed? Yeah, it was completely by accident, serendipity. So what we had was, so, so did you see, um, so I said one of the pulses was x-ray, an x-ray flash. And so one of the x-ray telescopes was just looking up in the sky and suddenly saw a big burst. Okay? That's not unusual. We, we see different x-ray, we see x-ray bursts for different reasons. Okay? But here's an x-ray burst. And it just so happened that there was an optical telescope that was looking in the same place. A complete, two completely different groups of instruments looking at the same point in the sky. And so what they detected was an X-ray burst followed by a regular supernova, something that we're more familiar with, and realized these two things are associated with each other. So, so that's what I mean by a handful. There's, 
Very lucky that two telescopes are looking at the same place. Yeah, there's just a few. Uh, oh yes, so uh, actually I didn't mention that the supergiants, when they looked, when they looked a little bit deeper into the data, what they actually find is a bright flash just before the regular supernova. They, I, I don't know why they didn't include it, or, I, oh no, I, know, I remember why. One group had the data and the other group didn't. Okay, <laughs> let's say it that way. And so they said this could be a, a whip crack, right? But they weren't sure, maybe it was just an unusual explosion, who knows, right? Um, but what we think is, is it's one of these going on. So, yeah, so we've seen just a few. That could be very exciting for your thesis. Oh, it was actually. It's part. It's part of my thesis now. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So could you elaborate a little bit further on how the massive web versus the light web? You mentioned how the low pitch translating to ultraviolet. Right. And then the high pitch into X-ray and gamma ray. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me think about my analogy here. I kind of, to, to be honest, I kind of just thought, what would, it, what would happen if I took a really fat whip and I just whacked it? And I think it would just make a low thud. I think if it was long enough, if I was strong enough to crack the whip, it would still make a low thud, uh, a lower pitch. Um, hmm. I can see, I can, I can see. I, Oh, oh, okay, okay. So, um, so, so the energy uh, that, so, so the pitch that you hear, okay, higher pitch actually has more energy per volume, let's say, right? It's, it's huh? Yeah. Oh, ah, what pitch? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> the vibrating really fast thing. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, oh, oh the demo. Okay, okay, here. Okay, if I could, if I could show you, thank you. That's actually really good. If I could show you the sound wave, okay, this is a, a, a low pitch. Oh, this is a great demo. Thank you. Okay, this is this is a low pitch. This is a high pitch. Okay, it's it's really fast here. Okay, there's a lot more energy on the high pitch. And actually, if uh, for lights, um, you can you can't see this, but light, if you broke it down and described it in terms of electromagnetics, there's, there's, a, there's a wavelength associated to them. And the, and the ones with shorter wavelength or higher energies, okay, those ones are like the X-rays and gamma rays. And for the uh, longer wavelengths, those are towards the UV. Um, thank, thank you very much. That's, that's just a good way to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Oh, so, um, like, what is the material that's creating the x-rays? Well, what I'm saying is, like, how do you tell if a star is made of oxygen or oh. helium from a telescope using infrared or um, gamma ray or other Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And how do you tell? Mm-hmm. That, that's a really good question. Um, maybe, oh, I, I don't know, okay. I, I just want to show a picture, but if I, if I took the light from the explosion. Let's say, think of a rainbow. If I zoomed into a rainbow, and let's say the rainbow came from water, you'll find that there are these dark bands suddenly appearing in the rainbow. You'll never see it with your naked eye, but there are these bands all across. And these bands are, are like fingerprints to the type of chemical that generated the rainbow. Okay. So it's like the light spectrum. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, that's the word I was going for. Yeah, so X-ray, in X-rays you have a spectrum as well. We, we study them here, we just take chemicals and, and we just make them really hot and see what kind of x-rays come out with our little x-ray detectors. And so once we have, like, so let's say a raw piece of carbon, bring it up to high energies, look at an x-ray and we see the spectrum, and we go look at these explosions and x-ray as well and just compare these two spectrums and say, oh, it's probably carbon, oh, it's oxygen. Yeah. Oh, she's waving. Okay, hi. <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah, that's a r- okay. Hold on. Why are you interested in that? Yeah. Okay. So, so what's really fun is that see the star here. It, it's not like the sun at all. Okay. Here, there's, there's you don't actually see the star. It's too small to see. But what you see is all this junk around it. Okay. So this is cloud and or cloud. This is gas that originated from the star. But because the star is so luminous, 
it just whips out its own mass. Okay, it doesn't care. It just throws it away, right? <laughs> the sun whips out mass too in coronal mass ejections. Okay, but think of this as more like a volcano. This is always on and just spewing gas out. Okay, what's really interesting is that we want to understand. Now these stars are very rare, and we expect them to go supernova very soon after. So they're just prime targets weighing in the sky. So when they do explode, what's really important to understand is actually right at the tip of the whip. The structure here really matters, right? Imagine if I had a big, I don't know, metal ball at the end. I, 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 it probably won't make a whip, but it, I don't know, it'll do something, right? But uh, if I change the mass here, it'll change the signature, change the pitch, it'll change the duration. What's really fun about a star with constant wind, what it does is it, it takes a star that, that's normally something like this, let's say the supergiant, there's a surface here, and it makes it really, really, really long because it's ejecting gas as constantly. And so um, one of the fun things I'm learning about is that a lot of people predict wolf riot stars, their size to be something like this. We observe their size to be something like this. Okay, there's a big disparity. And I think, it, uh, I think it's just, there's just a wind here, right? That makes us believe that a star is much bigger than it actually is. Um, so that's, that's one. The other one is I want to prove that by blowing it up, okay, or not me, but looking for one. <laughs> right, and then so we're going to see if I can predict what the structure of this whip is and then see what kind of snap I get. And uh, I'm very optimistic, actually. It's, go it's going pretty well. It's pretty, it's pretty hard, really, to be honest. I just, I just finished something really big in my coding project and I'm just absolutely relieved. It took all summer. <laughs> But I'm really happy, so uh, thank you. <laughs> I feel so good, thank you. <laughs> I, I, you don't get applauses for your thesis, really. <laughs> That's really nice, thanks. <laughs> uh, we'll take two more questions. Uh, what is your thesis statement? My thesis uh, statement is that there are these gamma ray flashes and x-ray flashes, and we understand where a lot of them are coming from. Uh, we don't understand where a lot of the other ones are coming from, but we think they're coming from this whiplash effect. And so we're trying to prove that, that yeah, that's where they're coming from. Yes, and last question. Just in hindsight, why did so many uh, teams mistake the yellow supergiant uh, supernova 4? Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, whoever publishes first, okay. kind yeah, of. What was the signature? What was the like, line? Like something that's so giant, something that's so tiny. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so different, different teams have access to different telescopes. And so at, uh, with this one, they happen to have two telescopes looking at the same time, looking somewhere. Okay. Um, one team just happened to be looking sooner than the other one. And they, they could look, they just have more information. Um, and so they predicted the yellow supergiants. Well, the other one, were, to be honest, a little bit quick, uh, did their analysis a little bit roughly uh, and, and concluded uh, that, so, yeah, yeah, haste, <laughs> that's, that's it, yeah, yeah, that's it. Let's give Stephen one more round of applause. Yeah. Um, so as you were coming in, you would have been given these feedback forms. If you could come to the front and put them in this box, we would really appreciate it. Um, there's a cookie as well if you don't have a pen. Um, to drive you, 